Hello everyone and welcome, this is The Apostate Prophet. I watched the conversation between Jordan Peterson and Mohammed Hijab. To be very honest, it was quite disappointing because Mohammed Hijab didn't give any compelling responses to the questions that Jordan Peterson asked. Jordan Peterson, on the other hand, seemed like he wasn't very well informed about the subject and didn't press on certain questions. The podcast episode is titled Islam and the Possibility of Peace and Jordan Peterson had a big problem with the idea that Islam has engaged in a lot of conflict from the very beginning that Muhammad was always at war, that Islam spread almost exclusively through war campaigns. And Muhammad Hijab kept deflecting again and again by bringing up other religions and other cultures. Now I have to offer some criticism to Jordan Peterson and his team. First off, Jordan Peterson did not push him on certain things that are absolutely vital to this discussion, such as Islam's treatment of minorities, of apostates, of heretics, of atheists, of disbelievers. These are things that Jordan Peterson Peterson is somewhat informed about. He didn't ask him about Muhammad Hijab's very hostile behavior toward others, which he justifies due to Islam. And Jordan Peterson is aware of these things. But it looks like he simply doesn't want to go very far and doesn't want to create a conflict. He wants to build bridges and thereby give up on extremely important points that we need to talk about. Now, coming to the discussion between Muhammad Hijab and Jordan Peterson, the first 20 to 25 minutes were extremely dry. Jordan Peterson asked from the very beginning what makes Islam and its theology so unique, what makes it true. What is it in terms of practice and belief that are absolutely core as far as you're concerned to practicing the Islamic faith? Muhammad Hijab did not offer any satisfying response except going over very basic aspects of known theological arguments. We believe in God. It's impossible for something to come from nothing. It's impossible also for something to give rise to itself. Why do you think that the same argument that you put forward in relationship to the generation of the universe can't be put forward as an objection in relationship to God. You take the existence of God as given in some sense to begin with, then you provide your belief with a rational argument, but it wasn't derived from a rational argument. But even if this theism makes sense for Islam, this doesn't make Islam unique at all. Muhammad Hijab failed to give an answer on what exactly makes Islam special. He barely talked about the fact that Muhammad is essential and that you must absolutely submit to him and follow him in order to become a part of Islam. He gave very little knowledge about Islam's general background and theology. What's funny is that around the 23 minute mark, he talks about how Islam was meant for all humanity because all the prophets that came before, including Jesus, only came for their own people, but Muhammad came for all humanity. All of the other prophets came for their people and their time. Muhammad came for all people and all times. Well, like that's a, certainly what Christians say about Christ. But in the Bible, you'll find some verses that are saying, I've only been sent for the lost sheep of Israel. That is rather funny because you could make the same objection by bringing up a lot of verses from the Quran in which it is said that Muhammad was merely sent as a warner and for every nation there is a warner and that he was sent to his people in their language, that he was merely sent to warn the mother of cities and its surroundings. Now, of course, Islam later turns toward a universalism, but that is an inner contradiction. And it could very well be that this universalism developed later on. And then he brought up a very, very silly argument and said that Muhammad is prophesied in Isaiah 42. We point to Isaiah 42, 11, where there indicates a new prophet that's going to come. First off, Isaiah is a prophet who is never mentioned in Islam. The book of Isaiah is not a book that is ever mentioned in Islam. The Quran only makes reference to the Torah revealed to Moses and the Zabur which may be the Psalms, but nobody knows what it actually is, and the Gospel, which is a supposed revelation to Jesus. So when Muhammad appeals to Isaiah 42, he's referring to a book that is not recognized in any way in Islam. It even specifies the region. It says it will be sent to the people of Kedar. No, it doesn't. It merely says, let the wilderness and its cities raise their voices, the settlements which Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Selah sing aloud. Let them shout for joy from the tops of the mountains. It nowhere talks about a prophet sent to Kedar. This is only Muhammad Hijab's very bad interpretation of the verses. Kedar was the son of Ishmael, or the Arabs. And in fact, the, the name of a mountain in Medina, which is present-day Saudi Arabia, is mentioned, which is the Mount of uh, Selah. He makes references to the locations of Salah and Kedar in Isaiah 42. But just because the Kedarites are supposed to be Arabs who are far up there because Arabs were a vast variety of tribes scattered 
all throughout the Middle East. And because Salah, which is up here, also happens to share the name of a Salah that is down here, he makes this about Muhammad. Unfortunately, the prophecy in Isaiah 42 does not fit the description of Muhammad at all. It talks about a servant who will come and who will not stop until he has ju brought justice upon the entire world. That clearly did not happen with Muhammad. This has been debunked many, many times, including by me and others. At some point, Muhammad Hijab began to recite the Quran, and that was very awkward. I had to cringe very, very hard. The Quran states, <laughs> And Jordan Peterson's response was just funny. You sang those verses or chanted them. I don't understand the language. Then you translated them. Why approach the answer to, to my question in that manner? What purpose does that serve in a discussion with someone like me? How do you know when that's appropriate and when it's not? Why did that make you smile? Muhammad Hijab's explanation as to why he recites the Quran like this to him in this context where Jordan Peterson will not understand anything anyway is that he wants to share the glory and the experience, full experience of the revelation of Allah with Jordan Peterson. The issue is what he doesn't understand is that it doesn't really matter. People will not be impressed by this and his recitation doesn't even sound good. Subhanallah <laughs> And this is not something that you're supposed to be doing. This is just something that he does out of nowhere. At around the 43rd minute, Muhammad Hijab made the claim that before the conquest of Mecca, all of Muhammad's wars were defensive. All of the wars that took place before the conquest of Mecca were defensive. This is only half true. Muhammad and his people engaged in a lot of raids and provocations before the conquest of Mecca. The first war that happened between the Meccan polytheists and Muhammad and the Muslims is a war that the Muslims anticipated, but that they also provoked. It is also understandable that Muhammad's wars in the Medinan time at the beginnings were mostly defensive, because Muhammad was not a big ruler who had accomplished a lot. Afterwards, however, he fought a lot of conquests, he fought a lot of wars that could have been resolved in different ways. Even the defensive wars could have been resolved in many different ways. And none of this takes away from the fact that he destroyed and exiled tribes, that he sent his people to conquer, and that Islam exploded, especially after Muhammad's death, and rapidly conquered large areas. What I find very funny is that Muhammad Hijab makes the strange claim that the Arab conquests, such a vast amount of land in a short time, as the underdeveloped people that they are, is actually a miracle for Islam, because people couldn't have done that otherwise. I see that the expansion of the Islamic empire is a proof for Islam. I believe it's miraculous, if anything, that this happened. Then why did it stop at why did it stop at Europe's borders, so to speak? If it was a well, miraculous it expansion, yeah, it stopped out because of. Uh, it wasn't successful there. It wasn't. It, it stopped where it, it, it couldn't go further. The Byzantine Empire and the Persians were plagued by nomadic tribes all the time. Nomadic tribes from the north, from the east, from the south plagued the Eastern Roman Empire and the Persians for centuries. Islam's expansion happened at a time where both the Byzantines and the Persians were very exhausted. And in fact, an expert on this matter, Dr. Robert Hoyland, in his book which concerns itself with the expansion of Islam makes the point that Islamic conquests, especially the initial conquests, are a little bit misrepresented because they were not all conquests under one banner. They were conquests under different Arabian forces, which later came together under one banner, the banner of Islam. Moreover, the Mongols that were relatively underdeveloped and that had nothing, that were simply up there in the north in the steppes, also invaded the world and brought empires to their knees, including the Islamic empires. Before them, the Huns did the same thing. The Avars did similar conquests. Nomadic tribes and people conquering their way through advanced civilizations is not something that is unique to the Arabs. The difference with Islam is that Islam came with a newly established religion and thereby the conquered places in the world were unified through a religion. At one point, Mohammed Hijab makes a very strange objection to Jordan Peterson's question when Dr. Peterson brings up the fact that Islam has been fractured in a bloody way from the very beginning and that conflicts began very soon. 
Mohammed Hijab then says, yeah, but how many people died? It was almost immediately after Muhammad's death that this fracturing took place among the people that were closely allied with him. And it was a bloody fracturing. And it isn't but obvious it's not, that it's been How rectified. bloody was it? How, how bloody was it? We're well, how about... bloody does it have to be? The point is, Islam began with conflict, inner conflicts. At minute 49, he talks about a treaty, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, between the Muslims and the Meccan polytheists. He praises this treaty as something great. And he also argues that the Meccan polytheists broke this treaty while this is, when you look at it from the outside, a contested matter. What is known about this treaty, even according to Islamic sources, is that the Muslims went toward Mecca. The two sides made a treaty of 10 years of non-violence, and the next year, the Muslims could come to Mecca for a pilgrimage. But a year or two later, a tribe that was allied to the polytheist Meccans attacked another tribe that was allied to the Muslims. And the Muslims then recognized this as a breach of the treaty and marched toward Mecca, with this time a much larger army than the army of the Meccans. The Meccans even tried to uphold the treaty, but the Muslims went and conquered Mecca anyway. Then the discussion came to Jordan Peterson calling Muhammad a warlord in the past. And Jordan Peterson was tricked into acknowledging that this was maybe a mistake. And you objected to my t use of the term warlord, and perhaps rightly so, you know, perhaps yeah. that was an injudicious comment. I was rather shocked when I was reading Islamic history, when I encountered the degree of violence that surrounded these events. He did not make a mistake. Muhammad was a warlord. Muhammad Hijab, of course, has a problem with this word, with this term, with this assertion, because warlord has these negative implications. And he tries to say Muhammad was not a warlord, because a warlord is somebody who relentlessly engages in wars for his own gain. If you look at the simple definitions of warlord, you will find that it is described for varieties of people based on the fact that they are aggressive military leaders who exert autonomy and authority over their people, and they fight and conquer left and right. Muhammad was, by these definitions, a warlord. Muhammad directly conquered left and right and imposed his own rule and destroyed temples and destroyed all kinds of idols and punished those who resisted the destructions of their temples and idols. The caliphs after Muhammad, who took over the Islamic Caliphate and whose mission it was to spread Islam either by invitations or through wars, were warlords. It doesn't matter whether they do it for their own gain or something else. This is a discussion that you cannot really resolve anyway, because you would have to convince the other side that that person is indeed full of bad intentions, which is why they are doing it for their own gain, which is why they are a warlord, according to Mohammed Hijab's definition. Mohammed Hijab argues that Islam is against totalitarianism, which is very funny. I know you're against totalitarianism. We are also against totalitarianism. <laughs> If we define totalitarianism as a central government trying to encroach every private and public matter of the citizens' lives. And this is something we don't believe in. I don't buy it. <laughs> the allegiance or non-allegiance to a state. Um, and you believe and you believe that the state should be Islamic and everybody should be forced to pledge allegiance to the state, don't you? No, I don't think that is any look, if it's a Muslim majority country, absolutely. According to Islam, Allah and Muhammad and the Quran are the law above everything else. You are supposed to obey them without questioning. Muslims are supposed to implement Islamic law. This law is above everyone, above everything. It cannot be changed, it cannot be challenged, it cannot be reformed, it cannot be questioned. Muslims are in a binding agreement with this system. They are not allowed to leave it or else they will be killed. They are not allowed to criticize it or else they will be killed. If you belong to a different religion, one that follows a book, you have lesser rights as long as you pay protection money or otherwise you are fair game. As for other religious groups, including heretics within Islam, whether they can be protected or not is a matter of disagreement. All people within the Islamic realm must perform their prayers. They must fast. Women must veil. If you engage in premarital or extramarital relationships, that is punishable by lashing or by death. Homosexuality is punishable by death. Drinking alcohol is punished with beatings or can lead to death. Slander or insulting a Muslim can lead to corporal punishments. Stealing can result in amputation. Music is banned. Dancing is banned. Depictions of humans or living beings is banned. Indecent depictions or exposure is banned and punishable. Women must obey their husbands and the husbands can beat the wives and the law is in charge of protecting this right. But of course, Muslims and Jordan Peterson are so similar in their opposition to totalitarianism and authoritarianism, of course. People like you, little weaklings, who leave their religion and cause 
uh, corruption in the land by spreading it, the capital punishment in Islamic law would be applied to you. We have no doubt and we're proud of that. If you did what you're doing right now in an ideal Islamic country, I'm sure there will be vigilantes, okay, that will take, that will take the law into their own hands. And here is where Muhammad Hijab became extremely deceptive. He argued that Islam has a solution and can bring peace. Because under Islam, people can live freely in peace. And Islam establishes a contract with the people who live under Islam. He made a constitution with Jewish people, with other people who are not Muslim at the time, protecting their rights to worship whoever they wanted to worship. We believe in a kind of pluralism in this sense. Christians were given courts. He talked about how Islam establishes a contract with the Christians and Jews who live under Islam. What Muhammad Hijab did not mention is that Christians and Jews are not equal in their rights and freedoms to Muslims under an Islamic state. Yes, they may live under an Islamic state in return for protection money, the jizya, but their religious freedoms are curbed severely. Their religious places of worship have to be low-key. They cannot proselytize. They cannot be too loud. They have to wear identifiers. They cannot disrespect the Muslims. Non-Muslims cannot testify against Muslims. Killing a non-Muslim does not require blood money or retaliation, whereas killing a Muslim does. Converting to Christianity or Judaism is punishable by death, while converting to Islam from Judaism and Christianity is encouraged and rewarded. Of course, Muhammad Hijab would never mention these things. He also did not mention what happens to those outside of Christianity and Judaism, to the atheists, for example, or people who worship different idols and different gods, who have different temples. He did not mention how Muhammad sent his armies to destroy temples throughout Arabia, and how his armies even killed the people who would worship around those idols and temples, and that Muhammad praised them for that. Of course, if Muhammad Hijab had bluntly revealed all of these things to Jordan Peterson in this conversation, the conversation would have gone much differently. Muhammad Hijab knows that, and deliberately sugarcoats his Islam for a Western audience. Jordan Peterson remarked that Muslim societies seem to be very behind when it comes to production. Comparatively speaking, per capita, the Muslim countries are not that productive economically. There are four out of 10 Muslim majority countries in the GDP per capita top 10. Brunei, Qatar, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. It's actually Qatar, Kuwait, Brunei, and United Arab Emirates. And that's no longer true, by the way. Only Qatar is now in the top 10. Jordan Peterson was quick to call him out on that and to remark that these countries are rich because of oil. Yeah, well, I'm not sure that I'm willing to grant the fact that most of that wealth is generated by oil. Outside of oil wealth. You have Brunei. Brunei is another country that's in the top 10. I, um, okay, so let's talk country. about Brunei. What have they done right in, in your estimation? I don't know much about Brunei, but I know they're in the top 10. I have to be honest with you. I guess I understand it if he doesn't know about Brunei, but Brunei is also rich because of oil and gas. One excuse that he made is that the Muslim world is just so backward right now and so much in conflict because of Western colonization. While there may be some truths to the idea that Western colonization caused some chaos within Muslim cultures, it is also true that Western colonialism, I'm sorry to say this, ended the endless conflicts in the name of Islam. And Islam has always been at war, at inner conflicts, long before the colonizations, from the beginning of Islam. So that's just a poor excuse. Much of the Muslim world is free and independent, doesn't depend on colonization, is not a subject of bombardments and wars. They could have the means to develop and to get somewhere if they weren't so much held back by their Islamic ideals. And finally, what I found personally very funny is Mohammed Hijab's remark that to him and to Muslims, it is a terrible, dishonorable thing to go against your word, to not stick with your word. Because if you make an agreement, then you should stick to it. That's very funny to me because Mohammed Hijab in the past challenged me to a debate and then accepted to have an online debate with me on a third party platform and then backed out. Then he told me to meet him in person and began to insult me and attack me in pretty terrible ways. And his excuse was that we only agreed to an online debate. We didn't condition it and sign a contract so it doesn't count. I'm sorry, but I can't really reconcile that with the idea that Muhammad Hijab cares so much about his word.
if he cares so much about it, maybe he should get back to his word and to the agreement that he made with me in the past. I'm still waiting. That's it. Overall, I find that the interview was very insignificant. Mohammed Hijab didn't make any great points. He didn't give any satisfying answers. He didn't answer the questions properly. He deflected a lot. He tried to preach a lot. While Jordan Peterson was on a quest to understand Islam and to understand the way it is and to find peace, Mohammed Hijab was focused on converting. Jordan Peterson, which just looks a little bit sleazy and doesn't work. I want to say I think Muhammad Hijab really betrayed the traditionalist orthodox Muslim narrative and he deviated a lot. If Jordan Peterson wants to find out more about traditionalist Islam and wants to go for a more traditionalist perspective, he should definitely invite Daniel Hakikachu. I think Daniel Hakikachu will give Jordan Peterson a lot of fantastic information about Islam. This is my personal recommendation. I vouch for Daniel Hakikachu. And of course, if you're interested in a student of psychology and religion who is to be killed, according to Mohammed Hijab and his best friend. And we're proud of that. Then I would also lovingly talk to Jordan Peterson. For now, this is all. I will see you soon. Have a fantastic day and stay away from Islam.